Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching another episode of the WeVA podcast. I'm super excited to welcome Luca Bureau Kellner. Luca is the lead author of LMQL, a super exciting new programming language for large language models and tool use. And I think kind of this space is just continually evolving of what these LLM frameworks are going to look like. And I think LMQL clearly adds something to this conversation. So before going any further, Luca, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Yeah, thank you, Connor, for having me. I'm happy to talk about Adam Kjell and also yeah, the entire space a bit. Yeah, awesome. So maybe before we even get into the details of LMQL, could you describe kind of like your research path and your PhD student at ETH and like what led you into uh, working with large language models? Yeah, so I'm, I'm in my PhD at ETH currently. Previously, I did my bachelor's in, in Berlin and also my master's, master's then here in Zurich at ETH. And yeah, I guess before I came into LLMs, I really was in the field or still am in the field of programming languages, um, mm. really something that fascinated me for my entire studies so far. Briefly, I also worked at a company building mostly tooling and, and a language in the JavaScript ecosystem. And yeah, during my master's, I also got, um, took a few machine learning lectures, started to look into this a bit and in general, my PhD studies are basically at this intersection of machine learning and programming languages. And yeah, like a year ago, basically, we started to look into LLMs because they seem to get more and more powerful and capable of doing many things. And this was like even before ChatGPT came out. So basically a different era, if you, if you look at it from, uh, from today. Um, and yeah, so we started working on on LLMs and started to think about how can we program with this? Like, is there some programming language perspective in here? And that's how we started working on LMQL. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting. I love how the LMQL, like just for me, it, the, just the syntax of it, how, how you have kind of like, it, it's like an SQL where it's like select from where it has this kind of look. And so I think it would kind of be, I'm really interested in also touching on that you know, pre chat GBT, how you were thinking about that before that, but I'd like to just, let's keep transitioning, like your perspective on programming languages, like what, like, what is a large language model programming language? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. Like obviously, <laughs> um, from an academic setting, it made sense to start to think about these in terms of programming systems, because I mean, previously machine learning models were mostly this models that were trained to do one task well, you put something in, you get something out. But mm. now with models that can take free text input, also like diffusion models, for instance, this becomes more of an interactive um, form of, of programming or interacting with these models. And when we set out to build something in the space, we were mostly motivated by this perspective of programming language models, like having machine learning models that offer this form of programmability of you can compose them, you can make them do different things and really um, to start to look, to look at this from this, this perspective. So I've kind of had a similar perspective, but coming from sort of the ensemble learning perspective where you kind of like ensemble model predictions and especially, you know, like these ideas like hugging GPT where you're routing inferences to do, like you have some kind of task and you break up the task into which of these models can perform each of the subtasks. It also kind of reminds me of this recent work on Gorilla. Uh, it's a large language model from Berkeley that's like fine-tuned to use particular tools. So it sounds mm -hmm. like you had that perspective of like composing machine learning inferences together to kind of say, okay, you're the lawyer or like you're the image generation model, <laughs> like this kind of segmentation of model inferences. Is that a correct understanding? Yeah, definitely. I would say this is almost already the next step. Like this is the step of there's this the master model, super model that composes different models, like in ensemble learning, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're essentially moving this responsibility of composing models to a human programmer. Um, so, so we say, okay, use you, humans can also compose machine learning models in this way, or like developer or programmer can do this. Um, tr it's true that of course this entire program of how to compose these things, mm -hmm. this could also be LLM generated. Um, I think this works with reasonable success so far. Um, I think there's a lot of potential in there. Um, but yeah, with the project, we're mostly focused on providing this to, to programmers, not necessarily in fully synthesizing this, this program that's, that's being executed on hmm. a higher level. 
Yeah, I think like the to me the challenge of designing that how you synthesize the program and the challenge in say like Lang Chain Llama Index or say Semantic Kernel Gina AI DeepSet is uh, like the abstractions change kind of right and so. I, when I first saw LMQL and the syntax of it, I thought it was something that was kind of like fundamentally different from sort of wrapping abstractions in like Python classes. Is there something to this kind of LMQL that would help? Like, how are you thinking about sort of your understanding of the abstractions evolving over time and how you would, uh, you know, adapt with that? I hope that question wasn't too open ended. <laughs> no, I, I totally see. Uh where you're going with this, like, I think there's lots of new ground to cover. And I think that's also the reason why lots of people have lots of different ideas on how to abstract these things. The design philosophy that we are following so far is mostly not from this top down perspective of how can we abstract things in the space. It's really coming from how do language models work internally. So we started mm. with the perspective of uh, Auto regressive large language models are token by token predictors, and there's these decoding algorithms like you can do R based decoding, you can do sampling, you can do beam search, you can do even more advanced things. Um, and we started from this perspective thinking about how can this core loop of token by token by token prediction be optimized? How can we control this more tightly on the one hand with constraining and on the other hand with um, scripted execution, like this way that LMQL enables you to you do template-based text generation. Yeah, I think the template-based thing is one of the instant things that jumped out to me about Langchain when it was first released is like, you know, you're chaining together language model calls and you put it in the, um, you put the output in the input. But um, I want to stand what you said about argmax and the internals of large language models. Like I, when I first saw LMQL, I saw that like you can switch argmax with beam search with say this, there's another paper called Flare. I've made a paper summary video of this on Weaviate, where it's this thing where you would sample the next sentence and then look at the uncertainty of those tokens. And if it's uncertain, you would then retrieve again. Basically, that there are all sorts of decoding things you can do. And yeah, that's pretty novel. I don't think, um, you know, the the like the other frameworks I think because they treat the language model APIs as sort of black boxes, right? So I don't know if like, I don't even think OpenAI with their API gives you that option to, um, uh, you know, like have beam search or like, or maybe it's just cooked into kind of like the temperature, right? Like, but or like tuning those kind of things. Is that clear? Like, yeah, I, I guess like, um, so how much opportunity is there to, because don't you need to have like uncertainty calibration and all sorts of things like that in order to make that kind of thing work? Yeah, definitely you do. Um, it's interesting, like um, actually depending on what API you use with OpenAI, especially if you use the now deprecated uh, completion APIs, you actually do get this information, at least mm -hmm. in, a limit, in a limited form. They do some obfuscation log. It's sometimes very, I assume for, for, um, to protect against um, model distillation, but you can actually get some of this out of there. It's obviously it's a bit restricted, but we, we put a lot, a lot of work in it and making it compatible and um, exactly for this reason, because the black box is actually not that black after all, especially with open models. Obviously you have full access, you get all of this information. And even with open AI models, you get some of this information and you can in fact implement beam search on top of these APIs. Um, now these completion APIs are being deprecated, but actually what, what OpenAI announced in the same blog post is that with the chat API, they will also add login mm. access in the future. I assume again, a limited form, but my hopes are definitely up to it that we can maintain the support because in the end, OpenAI models are what most people use these days. Yeah, uh, sorry, it's like jogging my memory. I was trying to think of something. I was just kind of, it's so interesting, but like, I, I do remember that you can like highlight the tokens on the API and yeah, obviously the open language models and yeah, sorry. So, so yeah, so that kind of idea of the decoding, I think just, um, I guess the question I wanted to ask you, and sorry that it took me a while to form this, is just um, like, it sounds like that alone would be quite a, like that would be a product by itself is how to decode from a language model. Do you see that as like being a, a, a big, like the, the amount of algorithms that you can write in that space? Like 
we see so much about inference acceleration, whether you're trying to quantize the weights or, you know, compress the model with knowledge distillation or pruning, but just that kind of like, you know, I, I don't know too much. I know like greedy, greedy decoding beam search. I think there's like some kind of contrastive sampling in there. Like it, how, how much research is there in that? Just like how you decode from the language model. Yeah. So this is, Lots and lots of research, actually. This is an entire um, research field on its own, especially kind of like in machine translation. They use very sophisticated, advanced versions of beam search. They, there's Monte Carlo-based kind of sampling mm. methods that are coming out now. I think the, the core difference here is obviously decoding on top of language models, especially if you have to work around open air restrictions, for instance, can be expensive and will also be slower even though they can lead to um, better results. And I think most, at least at this stage of, of um, like LLM hacking um, and practical LLM development, most people will just use ArcMix decoding. This is fast. This is more mm -hmm. or less cheap. Um, but I definitely see lots of potential to apply this in the future. Of course, what will what it will need is actually a library that's sort of, or LMGL maybe, uh, an ecosystem that actually implements all these decoders and makes them accessible to users that want to use them practically, because oftentimes, unfortunately, you only find them in somewhat esoteric research um, mm. repositories. So this is not um, directly usable for many for many practical developers. So, so, I mean, overall, I see lots of potential in applying most of this research to to the space that's that's um, evolving now. Yeah, I think uh, especially with the if the open source language model, like just generally is the cost of inference gets cheaper and cheaper, which seems to be, you know, every I feel like every week there's a new open source. Like I've grown tired of keeping up with it. Honestly, it's so intense, that just the news of it. But it's like, I think I see the two things like earlier, I mentioned flare flare is you sample the next sentence. And if there's a high uncertainty, you would then do another search query to get better information maybe for that. And that obviously with our interest in Weaviate and retrieval augmented generation has a huge application. But you mentioned Monte Carlo tree search. And there's this other really exciting uh, paper called Tree of Thoughts, where you know you sample these pathways, maybe have some kind of thing that would like cut um, cut nodes and then you know keep sampling and so on. But um, yeah, so and that kind of thing reminds me of like the, you know, like the Alpha Go that how it had that Monte Carlo tree search, that kind of look ahead search. How do you see that kind of like look ahead search and language modeling? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting direction. I also see, again, coming from programming languages, there's really cool projects that we are currently looking at and maybe hopefully we'll find time to eventually do. Um, <laughs> I think there's cool, essentially, if you think about these like three or four, for instance, it's a form of, um, yeah, ex search based programming. Like you build these reasoning algorithms, if you want to call it that, that and they are essentially define a search procedure in this tree where you expand thoughts or like hypotheses and, and, and like forms of reasoning the LLM produces. And ultimately, of, of course, this, this is uh, intuitively, it makes a lot of sense that this will actually help, um, with overall accuracy and quality. Although again, like I think prerequisite for this is that inference will become much cheaper, much faster and also should run in parallel, mm -hmm. of course, so you can actually explore many branches at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. also like ultimately, I think the big advantage of these methods is you can run an LLM and if it doesn't give you the output, you expect, you can run it again. You can sample from an LLM, right? But this is sort of a never ending process. Like in the end, each time could be the one time that it eventually works out, but there's no guarantee. So, um, ultimately what you actually want is the power of LLMs, this way to, uh, this, this, um, ability to sample but also a form of combinatorial search through the space of possible answers so that you get some guarantee that eventually you will find some model, some solution to the problem that you're looking for. And um, I think there's cool hybrid solutions that you can build in the space. And I see lots of potential there, yeah. Hmm. yeah what, what you're saying is really inspiring. Just I think just generally this is like connecting like model-based reinforcement learning where the agent has like a model of its environment so it can simulate, you know, action trajectories. And the, I guess there's all sorts of like exploring, exploiting that you could do even within traversing your own world model, right? Like usually I think in reinforcement learning, you think of explore, exploit is like 
uh, strategies you should take when interacting with your environment. I think there's like, um, uh, I don't remember the name of the paper, but something where, you know, there's like intrinsic motivation where the, the desire of the exploration is to strengthen the world model. And then this language model is the way it can simulate, you know, different trajectories. It's also fascinating, but so, yeah, so I, I wanted to kind of definitely touch on that because I think when I first looked at LMQL, seeing the arg max, I th imagine people listening who are looking into LMQL, that might be one of the newer things to look into. And then, but let's kind of, I want to talk also just about broadly how LMQL uh, connects LLMs with tools and sort of like generally your perspective on, you know, that kind of tool use concept. Yeah, definitely. So this big priority, or I mean, in, in the end, our whole philosophy is to say, well, can we sort of interweave just general programming language like um, Python in, the, in our case, like LMQL is essentially a superset of Python. You can just write whatever you would write in Python with the ability to, to, to ask a or like query a language model along the way and during execution. And this means you can actually go forth and back with a language model, call tools in between, call external retrieval systems, like your vector database, pull in information. Um, and this enables a very seamless and very close coupling of of LLM prompting, getting some results in possibly a structured form, executing some core, uh, some external tool, and then going back to the model. So, so, so um, from that perspective, this is really core DNA for us. Like this is the whole idea. We, we want to essentially bring this form of programmability and use of external tools to, to the prompting itself. Um, looking a bit into the future, we also have a couple of features that will assume be merged uh, and, and upstreamed, which will be enabling this much more easily. So, so essentially, there will be a seamless way to just expose some functions to the model and it will be able to call them along the way without the need for you to specify a specific um, protocol of how the model calls the function and how results are fed back. So, so definitely a direction we are also actively exploring. Yeah, I'd love to just kind of like that way of how you expose functions to the language model to get a little more clarity on that, because I see, you know, open AI funks, I think they're calling it or, you know, <laughs> or it's like the JSON dictionary kind of syntax. I see in LMQL, you, you it looks like, you know, it, it's like a hybrid between Python and SQL and sort of how it looks. And there's like, you know, death where you define like the calculator and stuff. So, so yeah, I, I guess like, um, yeah, like the design of how you're going to prompt the interface of functions towards to large language models. And I think, um, yeah, I hope that's not to like not specific enough of a question. I guess like um, th there's something interesting as well about uh, there's another paper from Omar Khattab and others called Demonstrate Search Predict, where they would also couple examples of how to use to tools or tasks broadly where you add kind of examples into this sort of thinking as well. So yeah, hopefully that uh, sets the stage of. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely like maybe I'm starting with the open air function calls. Mm -hmm. This is obviously a very interesting um, thing that they enable now. Um, we do intend to implement this, although not really just wrapping their API, we, we actually what our goal with LMQL in general is to not be model specific. So we intend to implement something very similar that essentially works like function calls a bit more seamless because we're already in Python. So we can already, you just pass the function. You don't need to um, bother with JSON schemas and everything. Um, but we actually want to make this not open as specific. So this will also just work the same way with open source models, basically abstracting whatever you need to do on the back end to make this work. Um, also like another detail that I'm not sure many people, um, know about is that actually the function calling of OpenAI is not strictly robust in a sense that it may still hallucinate, um, mm. the format. It does not strictly adhere to the, to the schema all the time, because ultimately it's based on fine tuning, not actually on, on strictly forcing the model to fit to the, to the schema and the schema. So, um, yeah, we, we're, our standards are more in the space of being vendor agnostic. Um, and actually providing these strong guarantees because we can do this with our constraint decoding engine. Mm. Can we say on that the constraint decoding engine? I've seen like structured output parser from Langchain, and I, 
you know, familiar with this of myself where you try to have it like output a JSON dictionary and then you're, the idea is you're going to parse the keys in the output from the language model. And it's like so important that it, um, you know, followed the rules sort of. So is this just kind of like, um, you know, like if it's doesn't output a square angular bracket after search, you reject it. Like what, what are the ideas behind constrained sampling? Yeah, so I think this is one of the biggest issues with, if you think about LLMs from a programmability perspective, this is one of the biggest issues. Like in regular programs, you write a function and you know, whenever you call this function, it will do what you wrote down. Like typically these are not um, randomized in behavior. Um, but with LLMs, it doesn't quite work this way. Like all the examples you used during development could be fine. But then um, at in practice, when some user <laughs> uses this function, indirectly because they use your product, this may just fail for for arbitrary reasons. Like there's no, <laughs> it's really hard to get a grasp on, on why they fail sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and this makes programming actually really hard, right? This means functions fail randomly and not just in a, they produce the wrong output sense, but they don't even um, produce output in the right format. Like this is sort of the interface robustness is not even given. Mm. So. So I think, and this is one of the core challenges I still see with LLM programming, and also what we try to work on is make this interface 100%. And even if the result doesn't end up being correct, this you can deal with. But if the format does, is not correct, you essentially get the equivalent of null pointer exceptions in your language, and this will typically crash your program unless you handle this somehow um, very flexibly, but this is also really difficult to work with. Yeah, I love that you just named that interface robustness. I hadn't heard that particular phrase, and I think that just nails it right on the head. I, I'm familiar with robustness and deep learning as well, like, you know, some of the stuff Dan Hendricks did with, um, like, image classifiers, where he would show that, you know, if you increase the brightness or make the image snowy, all of a sudden that ImageNet test set accuracy goes from, like, 95 to, like, 40% accuracy. And, you know, obviously that kind of thing is manifested in language models as well. And so prompting it to use a tool, you know, could create that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's a really fascinating kind of thing is just forcing it to use the tools. And I guess kind of one more thing before moving on topics, I wanted to get your opinion on earlier, I mentioned Gorilla. Gorilla is like a LLM fine tuned to use particular tools like, you know, a GitHub CLI to make pull requests and stuff. And I've been thinking really heavily about, you know, with Weaviate, you know, Weaviate, you can see Weaviate as a tool I see kind of two schools of thought with thinking about this. You can either just think about retrieval augmented generation in a pretty blind way where you the vector search engine just gives you context blindly, sort of, and then you just put that into the input. Or you can think of it as a tool where you're deciding like which of the classes, because it's you know like vector database, like you have like different classes for your data. You like which of these classes do I want to search through? Uh, which of the properties do I want to access? Or you know maybe even formulating your queries. This one's a little hand wavy, but maybe the idea of um, you have a particular query that you would say, oh, I want to weight BM25 higher than vector search for this one, or I want to re-rank it with a cross encoder. So like generally kind of like the the tool of Weavier, like using the API. So I think heavily about whether we should train a language model that, you know, is like that glue between using Weavier. So so I guess the the question is like, how do you see these kind of language models fine-tuned to a particular tool, whether that's Weaviate or Wolfram Alpha or, you know, what have you. I mean, fundamentally, uh, this, I mean, it's very clear that fine-tuning will help the model to adhere to whatever you're wanting it to do. Um, coming back to interface robustness, fine-tuning is just mm. the same, will just fail in the same way, maybe at a, at a lower rate. But I mm. guess the problem here is, if you have more than one call and you have a low percentage of each call failing in some, you will have actually a high, um, high probability of things failing. Hmm. I guess still, like, like, of course you want the, um, you want the language models to actually be fine to exactly what you needed to do. On the other hand, what I hear and also what I think is the most, one of the most, um, yeah, fun aspects about LLMs and also like in terms of in economical terms, the fact that you don't have to train them is actually one of the biggest advantages and biggest strengths, right? right. They are general purpose, <laughs> multi, 
uh, multitask reasoners and you don't have to train them, meaning you don't have to invest the effort and time to build data sets. And in some situations, this may not even be possible. Like it's sometimes really hard to construct these kind of data sets. Yeah, I guess like is a solution to interface robustness just you take the output and then you say, template it and say, did you follow the instructions, right? And then see if it revises output, right? Isn't that kind of like the, um, they used to have a, uh, there was a name for that kind of prompting. I think reflection spelled funny, like with an X. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, this, this is one way to do it. If you assume some independent error rate, eventually you will get there. In practice, usually there's no guarantee. And if something is wrong, it's typically because there's some weak spot in the model. And even if you make it revise its output, it may still have somehow some weird internal state that makes it repeatedly make the wrong, do the wrong thing, right? Now, concretely, how we implement this and also the fundamental technique behind this that other frameworks start to pick up on also is the idea of constraint decoding, meaning you don't even allow the model in terms of interface robustness to produce something that would be illegal. You force it to produce it. It's a bit like like one very traditional way of doing this is just hooking a parser and say, you can only produce tokens that are actually um, allowed next according to my grammar. And this makes, the, makes sure that the model will only produce outputs that are consistent with your grammar. And this means you can parse this robustly and there will never be a situation where you will end up with an output that you can't parse in the sense. So essentially you force the model strictly to adhere to a certain for output format and there's no need to revise or even um, depending on how you do it, there's not even, not even a, um, you don't even need to tell the model about this. Like you can just restrict it strictly, restrict its output distribution to only fit in this format that you provide. Hmm. It's making me think of like, um, you know, like automata theory and all that kind of um, like grammar, regular expression, that kind of, because I'm just like kind of, you know, getting the story of Luca interest in programming languages and now taking it in this kind of Chomsky like um, perspective. Do you, so you think about it and can you help me kind of understand that perspective of like formal languages a little further and how that would inspire this design? Yeah, so actually the, the parallels to parser and also like Chomsky and, and language theory is is um, very clear and and also in, in terms of expressiveness, you can very much um, <laughs> like anchor it there. Like if the, if you think about LMQL from a parser perspective, it is, it is essentially a dynamically constructed parser that's hooked up to your language model and that will make sure that the, that all the language model can only use the follow set as you would name it in, in parser terms um, of tokens that will can actually follow at the current position. It's a bit like when you write code in your IDE and you open code assist, it will only allow you to insert identifiers and keywords that actually are legal at this position in a program. Hmm. Wow, yeah. So that, that was an awesome tour. I just gained a ton of understanding of what an, uh, what an LLM programming language would mean, especially in this context of... Um, you know, of uh, interfacing it with functions and having it adhere to the syntax or having it adhere to that this kind of thing. Um, so uh, kind of skipping topics, uh, I wanted to jump ahead to something that just blew my mind when I saw it, which was the LMQL playground. I think this is such a cool visual demonstration of these, you know, complex language model calls. Can you tell me about the design of it? Yeah, so we um, essentially, when we, in the process of building um, LMQL, we started to also build a graphical or visual debugger interface, mm -hmm. which is actually fully available on the web. So I invite everyone to just go to its lmql.ai slash playground. You can actually run all of LMQL in the browser in this graphical user interface, which will allow you to gain a better understanding of what's actually happening. Also, especially on the decoder level, if you always wanted to see like a, a visual representation of how um, Beam Search works or what other tokens the model has considered at particular points and during generation, like all the different ways that were not explored, actually, this is a really cool way to see this. Um, also, big shout out, by the way, to the um, Pyodite team. They're building a Python, a WebAssembly version of Python, 
Hmm. And this is the only reason that LMQL actually can even run in the browser. So this is also a really awesome project. Um, now the playground itself, I would say it started out as a debugging tool and it, we still use it heavily in that sense because it enables us to really go token by token, step by step. We do a lot of token by token computations, masking, hmm. validation, um, also all our decoding algorithms that are branching can be visualized. There's, there's a graph view that actually allows you to see all the different sequences that are being decoded, how they relate to each other, what's the origin of, of decoding in general. So um, this helps a lot. And But then again, yeah, on, on a, from an educational perspective, it's also really interesting to explore just from as a user, I would say. Um, you would learn a lot about um, internals. Um, we also, by, by the way, provide actually, we haven't, this paper is not public yet, but this will come out soon. We um, implement, now implement a high level library for implementing custom decoders. So as something like Tree of Thoughts, for instance, or more advanced beam switch variants, you could now express very easily with a, with a high level language in LMQL in the, or in the internals of LMQL. And you would get all of this tooling for free. So you can write your own decoder, see the graphical results in the, in the inspector or in the playground um, and play around with this. Yeah. I definitely want to come back to that, but just kind of like for our listeners coming to LMQL for the playground for the first time, could you explain like how it would visualize say auto G auto GPT is this problem where it's kind of like, you know, write a set of tasks and then start executing the tasks and then reflect on, you know, are, is the execution of these tasks getting me closer to my goal? And I think it's one of these things that we, you know, is so like, it's such a compelling idea, but then it's kind of hard to tame it in the real world. And I think this is like having this kind of visualization. Could you just kind of maybe explain the TL, like the high level explanation, like this kind of example of this, you know, like recursive, do you need to keep doing things sort of? <laughs> yeah, so I, this, I mean, that's a great point, I think. Um, uh, now, the current state of LMQL or the LMQL playground is we really focus on this single query, query, meaning an LMQL query is usually a long prompt that keeps on extending. You can have different parts where the LM is called, but ultimately you, you're generating one text document in a sequential order until you come to an end when you have done or gotten all your results. Um, things like AutoGPT or more like compositional frameworks where you chain calls together, um, obviously actually have more than one such call. And we definitely plan to add this, um, but for this, we, still, we first have to realize all our plans in a compositional mm -hmm. um, space as well. Um, but essentially what you want really is a regular debugger with function calls and stacks and a stack frame and have like recursive calls being in the context of their parent calls, right? You mm -hmm. can jump into them, go token by token, go back out, see the, the parent call. Like, like this kind of tooling definitely um, would be very useful. Um, although I'm not really all for reinventing the wheel here. So maybe there's also a very smart integration that you could do with existing Python-based debuggers, adding mm -hmm. the lower level of when you execute a prompt function, you can actually also step token by token. Fascinating. So it's so that kind of parallel of you know how you would do a stack trace with you know any kind of like you know C code or so on compared to maybe like you know we've seen like Langflow where we have like these DAGs that kind of you know show like um uh, uh you know I called a calculator I got the result or like I wrote this Python code I executed it and that kind of thing um. Yeah, wow, it's pretty interesting. I mean, I don't think I have a, a great uh, question. Just, um, yeah, like I, that, that hearing that parallel really opened up my understanding of it, comparing it with the traditional stack tracing and debugging that already exists. And yeah, it makes perfect sense that that stuff would translate, you know, right into this kind of uh, language model stuff. So, so yeah, I think um, maybe um, with the LMQL playground, I, I guess, and kind of like also when you originally land on LMQL, uh, you have these set of examples. Could you maybe describe like an example to listeners that, you know, you particularly like and helps kind of illustrate LMQL? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think one of the, the, the simplest and, and one step beyond just asking ChatGPT something, prompting method is basically called channel thought, right? This is 
so some this may still be new. Um, essentially, the idea is to not ask the language model to directly provide a response, but it, instead you you first ask the model to but you provide a question. You ask the model mm -hmm. to provide um, a reasoning how it would come to a response. So essentially, mm -hmm. you just ask the model to reason step by step, and then eventually after it did this, you ask now give me the answer, meaning you um, you help the model in sort of providing a a small algorithm basically on how to arrive to um, at an answer instead of just directly producing it. And this has been shown to to create success um, that this works really well. Like this is much better than just directly producing the answer. And the way you would do this, for instance, in LMQL is you just write, you write down the question in your query code, you write, let's think step by step. Then you have a placeholder that you insert where all the model reasoning goes. And then, mm -hmm. You ask the model in a fo in a follow up statement. Now give me the answer, um, and this actually also enables you to have like free text reasoning. The model will do some number arithmetic, maybe whatever kind of reasoning is required. And then eventually, when you actually want to retrieve the answer, you can then leverage, for instance, LMQL constraints, saying, "Okay, now I want an integer number that represents the the answer." Um, Coming back to interface robustness, this means you have sort of a natural language-based reasoning process, but the output, the return value of your prompt function actually will be an integer value that you can robustly handle in the rest of your program code. So I think this, this um, illustrates quite well, like the, the sort of standard process of, of how LMGL typically works. Yeah, that's a really great clarification of, um, you know, the difference between when you want to enforce the structured output parsing compared to where you want to let it just have the open ended reasoning. And um, maybe to read this to listeners to kind of also get, you know, for people just listening and not also looking at this, uh, you know, if you go to LMQL.ai where you click chain of thought, and that's kind of the example that we're talking through right now. So you have the argmax and then you have a question. It was September 1st, 2021, a week ago. What is the date 10 days ago in mm slash dd slash yyy quest so like you know forcing that kind of uh, structure already and then but then you give the answer choices where you have you know a b c d e f these are each like dates formatted like that then you have let's think step by step and then you have reasoning and then you say therefore among a through b the answer is result can you tell me a little more about uh, like reasoning and result and just how LMQL parses that? So essentially you have to read it like a sequential program. It's executed top to bottom, left to right. And top level strings that you see in a query are just um, passed to the model as prompt. And mm -hmm. whenever you have in your top level str string a placeholder variable in, in square brackets, this is when we actually invoke the language model to produce a response. Um, and the prompt the language model will get for this particular call is whatever text has been consumed so far by a sequential execution of your program. And the language model will come to naturally come to an end. Typically, language models just produce some end of sequence token with return some, some text that represents the reasoning. And in, in LMQL and program logic, this means after executing the statement, there is a variable defined in your program context called reasoning, which will just be a string. Mm -hmm. um, and you can access the string, you can print the reasoning the LLM used. You can also just um, ignore it. It will from now on be part of the follow-up prompts that you will send to the language model. So here in this example, you will continue, you will prompt the model, therefore the answer is, um, and the model will actually see its previous output. So in the next call, when we produce the actual result and it will see its reasoning, it will see the original question, it will see the new prompt asking it to produce an answer. And for result, this final placeholder variable here, and we have additionally defined constraints. So we, we can actually now limit the language model mm -hmm. to say, well, result should be one of A to F. And mm -hmm. we can enforce this strictly, which can just limit the distribution of the model to be only across A through F and no other tokens are allowed, which means we can we have guarantees about the format of this final mm -hmm. output, right? <laughs> um, because in practice, what will happen, this works most of the time. And then at some um, odd degenerate case, the model will just use some other letter maybe or something else entirely. Um, and you can't parse this. 
And by using constraints in LMGL, you can actually guarantee this will be one of A through F, and there's no other way that this program will terminate. The return value will, will be one of those. And this means you can just return this result value to your program logic. You can also use it to index an array with, with limited options in this case. And this will all work robustly without any need to do output parsing or some, some, some fuzzy logic to validate the result. Yeah, it's be, I, I love the way it like where result in, you know, A, B, C, D, how you have that syntax. I think, yeah, it's really, it's super cool. I mean, I, I, I have played with a lot of prompts where you're saying like, if, and then, you know, like you're prompting it with if else kind of logic where you say if, and then some abstract natural language description of what to do with the thing. And then, then output like, you know, no change needed or whatever. Right. And so this syntax to constrain it to certain valuables, as you discussed, and then, or constrain it to be a type, maybe even like make sure it's Boolean would achieve that same kind of, th I don't know, but like, I guess, cause it is free text, but <laughs> yeah, like th this kind of syntax is so elegant. And so it brings me to my next question, which is kind of a hairier question is, and you know, you know, like it's such a convincing thing. I would, would love to get running with this. Like, how does this integrate with the existing frameworks? Like I know there's an integration with Llama index, like. Is this just kind of treated as like one of the structured output parsers? How does LMQL kind of like, what is the early stage of this integrating in the current sort of like LLM software tools? Yeah, so actually the, I'm quite happy about the current state of, of integrating. Like essentially we can integrate with all of them more or less. And the reason for this is that most frameworks are um, compositional and they have this black box, box perspective and they do lots of chaining calls together, or like mm -hmm. even in some kind of tree structure in our index, they do lots of interesting things. But since they assume the language model itself is a black box and LMGL mostly operates in this black box, we can always just fit in this black box. They, it's a black box to them. They have no assumption about its inner workings and LMGL fills this black box, leverage some more, some more um, advanced information from the LLM. And so in that sense, we can, for instance, in LangChain, we can just operate as a chain component. We can just, it's just a LMQL, func uh, LMQL queries are just Python functions. And, and this fits very well with most compositional frameworks. So, so there's lots of, um, yeah, to be had from each other. So on the one hand, we can use Lama index or LangChain to retrieve, use re all the retrieval integrations to insert them into the prompt. On the other hand, LMQL programs can be used as part of your hmm. agent, but we have like more, yeah, um, auto GPT variants using LMQL, all sorts of projects just employ it as, as sort of the as a as a fundamental building block in what what they're building compositionally with LLMs. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I guess like kind of the other thing is like you know I I love this kind of like the LLMs write the code, and I think this uh, like. I love this question of like, I feel like the LLM itself could be prompted to write LMQL code. Like if you, uh, you know, say uh, you give it these, uh, I think nine examples of tell a joke, packing list, chain of thought, and then you give it these examples, then ask the LLM to write new things. <laughs> Do you think about interfacing LMQL that way? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, obviously in the current uh, day and age, this is number one thing people <laughs> talk about also with, to us. Um, obviously, as PL people, like we work on programming languages, we design minimal and, and concise abstractions. That's our mm. at least uh, labor of love. Um, that this hurts a bit. Like we, we build a, a nice programming language, and then people don't want to use it. They, they just want the LLM to use it, um, which is actually an entirely different, very interesting program. Mm. Can we build la programming languages that are work particularly well with LLMs? Um, because this, this is fundamentally they use the LLMs are really good at using, for instance, Python because it's popular on the internet. Mm. But what if we designed a language that was by, on, by, on first principles based on being an interface to LLMs and not to humans? This, this is a very interesting problem, I think, to work on. Like, that see lots of potential there. As far as it comes to LMQL, um, we have some limited experience with this. Essentially, for instance, if you write LMQL in your um, editor of choice and you have, for instance, GitHub Copilot installed, um, GitHub Copilot will, after a few demonstrations of LMQL, effortlessly write LMQL. Like, this mm. is 
so close mm -hmm. to Python and semantics are mostly declarative that it's not really hard for, for um, the auto completion models to pick up on this. Um, we haven't done more for our experience, experiments than, than this. Um, so there may be something there. For us, it's mostly about time currently. Like we have so many mm. directions and projects to explore. Um, incredibly busy these days. So so hopefully at some point we can we get to work on this. But yeah, not not directly right now. It's not a priority okay. for us. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's very interesting hearing the um, the frustration of a designer <laughs> of programming languages that the yeah. LLM people want. Yeah. So you mentioned the you know the time thing, and it, I'm very curious. Just kind of you know, I've learned so much from talking with you in these 45 minutes. You certainly seem like you have a really you know exciting vision for the future of this. What are some of these like um, you know future projects directions that you're going with LLQL? So, I mean, on a, on a high level, I think that the most fascinating thing to me, being a PL and machine learning person, is this, this, this new generation of models that's programmable so suddenly. Like, you can prompt them to do things. You can compose them in new ways. They're not just one-task reasoners. They're multitask reasoners. And mm -hmm. for me, this is incredibly interesting. I think also um, talking to people in, in, like, bigger labs, there is interest in building models that are programmable in the sense, maybe even beyond prompting. Like maybe you, we can find more formal languages, train foundation models on different kinds of data that are programmable and composable in the sense. So, so I think in, in general, this field is, is really amazing. I think multi-modality definitely want to integrate this. Um, not sure about the programming models there, for instance, programming with images is very different, usually done visually. Mm -hmm. Um, then with text, like text is obviously the, the most, the closest thing to, to, to code as well. So, um, yeah, we'll definitely explore this. This, uh, I think this is incredibly interesting. In a way, like also our initial paper, the core insight is prompting is programming. Like this is enables a new form of, of programming that will be fundamentally different from what we know so far because you don't have to space, specify every detail. You have these new reasoning engines that you can mm. use as building blocks. You can make fuzzy things, hard things that were hard, things that were hard so far suddenly became much easier to do with LLM. So, so it's very interesting to explore it in this way. However, now on a much more concrete level, we also have lots of things we want to do with LMGL, of course. Um, we're definitely thinking about compositional stuff, like chaining stuff together, map reduce style computations with LLMs. Um, I, for now, we're very minimalistic. We try not to add too many abstractions. The feedback from the community often is very harsh with regards to these. Um, I think they should be well thought out. It's, it's hard to find the right abstractions as long as things are moving that fast. But we definitely have some ideas around like algorithmic use as well, like LLM-based sorting algorithms, for instance, or like just using LLMs as data transformation tools to go from one form it to another in a much more um, mm -hmm. yeah, machine learning based way. And then like something that's more or less coming up more or less immediately is um, also types. Like we will add types to LMQL. We have integer types for now, but this will extend to um, regex matching, but also structural types like data classes, JSON. Um, yeah, I think this will be really useful and practical to have also for LLM programming in general. Yeah, that's a. Re I love that you know future perspective. Also, immediately very grounded. I you know I learned a lot about you, like the structured output parsing and being I think one of the key constraints to enforce with large language model uh, programming. I love this kind of moving data from one format to the other, like CSV to JSON. That's just like a common thing that people want to use. But um, so I really wanted to earlier brought this up quickly. There's there's this other. Uh, I wouldn't compare, I wouldn't call it quite like um, LMQL, but uh, demonstrate, search, predict, DSP. Basically, the idea is um, like one part of the idea that I understand well, and I'm sure Omar would give a much better description of it. But like my understanding of it, let me like frame it that way first, is like you would retrieve some examples of a task. So you have some input output of like, I don't know how I like to respond to emails about Weaviate, something particular like that. And then it will um, look at intermediate tool use kind of chains to 
to get to that output that you've demonstrated. And you give it a few examples of it. And so it will compile some kind of like intermediate reasoning chain sort of. And it makes me think, and then you, you know, cause you mentioned the multitask learning kind of perspective. And I guess I'm just, I hope that I'm framing this right, but like this thing about like gradient descent, is it still needed to adapt to new tasks or do we just kind of like compile new chains of tool use and checking parts and adding structured parsing and in the middle, I, I hope that question is clear. <laughs> I mean, coming from core machine learning more or less, I'm not ready to give up on, on gradient descent, let's say. <laughs> um, I, I did, before I worked also on differentiable programming languages. And actually, I think there's lots of really cool potential to explore there. Like there's this ongoing debate also about is prompting enough or will prompting actually eventually die in, uh, this, mm -hmm. in, in, and, and fine tuning will arise again. Um, obviously for now, the more resource uh, conscious thing to do is prompting because you don't have to spin up your own GPU machine. Some of these really large models are not even feasible to train for smaller companies. But then like there's these much more very interesting sparse ways to, to fine tune models now. So I think actually, um, and we're thinking about this, like completely um, dismissing the, the neural layer that actually is below below the text layer that we have now is I think is, is not, um, we shouldn't do this. Like, I think there's lots of um, bottlenecking, like the, the text layer is actually a bottleneck. Like, hmm. especially if you chain multiple calls together, um, lots of information is lost in just putting the t output text of one call into the next call. Like hmm. the model has very rich representations internally. So I think actually composing models and also large pre-trained models on a neural level, like actually passing mm. hidden states, latent representations along. This could be really interesting in the future. Obviously, for now, it's also a resource issue. Like you need GPUs, you need to run these models more or less locally to do this. Um, but yeah, thinking longer into the future, I think we may even go back to the neural layer, not say on the text layer. I think text layer is also something that was born out of practicality and and for economical reasons. Hmm. So oh, this, is, <laughs> this is really, really interesting. I like, I, I'm really fascinating in these architectures, like retro fusion in decoder, memorizing transformers, long llama is one that John Trengrove at WeVA sent to me today, just like the latest iteration of this, where you, you know, you have the um, attention over vectors retrieved by something like a vector I don't want to say vector database because, you know, like a vector index, like something to facilitate approximate nearest neighbor search at like absolutely enormous scale. And then the difference is instead of just putting that in the input layer, you put it in layer like eight out of 12 of the transformer and it attends over those latent representations. And you could imagine like there's this other paper called uh, Transformers are Universal Computation Engines or something that shows that image embedding spaces can be processed by text embedding models and when you give it the latent space and in the intermediate layer, not the input. So, and then you're describing this composability thing. So it's like this idea of having some kind of debugging for that kind of architecture as well. <laughs> that kind of like intermediate. So, so yeah, like um, how do you see those kind of architectures being realized though? Is it going to take someone, you know, just, just, just trying to, you know, change out maybe one of the open models like MPT or Falcon or say, you know, GBT3 is modified to have this kind of extension because, you know, like what, what's kind of the state of that, like putting the latent representations in the middle of other models and combining models oof, and then <laughs> combining mo models that way. It's really fascinating stuff. Yeah, so, I mean, I think... Um... If we look at OpenAI, what they do, um, currently they're very into this. We have a text-based API. You put text in, you get text out. Um, the chat APIs are much more limited than the previous completion APIs. They're moving more towards this. It's a magic function. It does sometimes that's what you want it to do. Um, obviously, that's actually moving away from this interface that we would need to implement more um, neurally based systems. Um, so. I guess to do this right now, the only way is to actually work with open models. Um, mm. I also can see if this actually works out, like 
I'm sure many people work on these kind of issues also already. If this in the end um, is promising also to them, I can imagine them opening this up, maybe providing some kind of platform. I mean, at this point, we don't know. Um, I think for now, we are even open air as GPU constraint, at least as far as I know. So actually exposing this kind of much deeper um, interface would be difficult for now. And probably also from a proprietary perspective, not too smart. Like if you leak your hidden states, mm. model distillation becomes much easier, of course. So yeah, I guess if you want to implement this today, you will probably have to resort to open models. Um, and then for other things, more proprietary APIs, it will be interesting to see where the interfaces go. Like now chip D4 will also at some point accept image input, which, which will be a limited form of this more or less, right? You can now also embed some image and this will be passed to the, to the um, text model to be processed by the text model. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, it's hard to tell at this point. I think um, resource constra constraints, it's for everyone, resource constraints are currently the bottleneck to do this. Hmm. Yeah, it's this is this conversation has totally opened my eyes to how this is. I've heard these things that there's these rumors on Twitter and so on that GPT four is like a mixture of experts model, and I think the architecture of mixture of experts is kind of like a composable model in one. It kind of reminds me of just like you know like lottery ticket hypothesis showing that sparse networks can you know carry the burden, and so probably what happens is we have this like mix of sparse networks. It's kind of like that um, uh, thousand brains theory. Uh, it's been a long time since I really did that, but like that kind of idea that you you have this kind of composability within dense architectures as is, but if you explicitly separate it, huh, it's so, I mean, it, it really makes me think about like whether vector indexes would compose embeddings from multiple models as well. It's not something I've ever thought about, like having like open AI embeddings as well as clip, in, uh, like, you know, the A to two text embeddings with the clip embeddings, like totally separate models, but in the same kind of index. And uh, yeah, there's just so many interesting ideas to that, I think really. So yeah, uh, so yeah, I definitely got on the train of thinking towards the future. It, you know, I think we're mostly thinking of composing model inferences purely through the text input, text output kind of landscape. Do you think, like, I think we're, we're, we might be dreaming a little bit. Do you think that's, how long do you think that'll still be the most common way of interfacing models with each other? Wow. I mean, at this point, it's really hard to say things are moving so fast. Mm -hmm. Although, yeah, it's really hard to tell. Like at this point, um, bigger shops mm -hmm. closing down more and more means also that any day someone releases some new model, this or something bigger and, and entire research fields are being disrupted by this more or less. So it's hard to tell where this is going. Um, I think from a programming perspective, the text layer definitely is something very accessible. Like coming from PL, having a model that takes natural language input and does more or less what you tell it to do is the best programming language in the world, right? It's just natural language. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And this is incredibly accessible to so many people. That's also why so many people use ChatGPT because they essentially they essentially just overnight learn to code because they can just instruct the computer to do something <laughs> and it doesn't. And like having a lot of uh, passion about coding, I ca I get them. Like obviously this is amazing to them having this ability now. Um, but so in that sense, I think the text layer is really interesting as an input. As an output, of course, you can also do images. I've seen really cool projects about models outputting code that then renders as user interface. This is also really cool. Like personally, I've grown a bit tired of reading long, wordy paragraphs of of a language model output. Like this seems this seems to take it. Like for my present taste, this takes too long. I want to be um, <laughs> effective in, in taking out up this kind of information. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's lots of um, benefits to the text layer, um, especially for like everyone that's not super technical and wants just wants to use some some chatbot API or some chatbot interface to to get some answers to their question. 
Yeah, I think, whew, I mean, this whole perspective, I think most of the LLM frameworks, I don't like, I guess it's like, I still think of LMQL this way, even though I think of you as a scientist, like, like, I think what we're talking, like what we started talking about, about just composable models, I still don't quite understand how that would work in LMQL quite yet, but I'm sure that you'll figure that out. But it just like, um, like moving past text being the how the bottleneck for uh, language model chains, language model tools interacting with others, even just with embedding. So like, maybe let me take a step back and tell this kind of like, you know, like we have this feature in Weavia called Reftivec that we often use for recommendations. So, you know, I'm Connor and I like these three basketball shoes. And so then I have like this vector that captures my taste in basketball shoes or like say my taste in movies, right? And then I have Luca's taste in movies and maybe we find some, you know, we average these vectors and then a generative model, you know, produces a movie that would be something that me and Luca would like. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like moving into tensors or vectors. I mean, how do LLM frameworks get there? Um, like it's such a, it's such a eye opening idea. I think it's totally different paradigm. Like I, I think, and, and it makes sense. Like we're currently building things for the text layer and, and, this is really cool and fun. If we, mm -hmm. I think this would be a different thing. Like there would be, I guess, different abstractions. I mean, I'm not even convinced that we landed on the right abstractions currently on the text layer there. And, and also the models are still moving. So, so who knows where, where this will go? Like essentially we just have to try out most things and then see what works. Right. Mm -hmm. And then going to this more, um, like I would say that what you propose this sort of averaging of vectors and then putting this into a model that this is definitely some form of composable or pro programmable model at that, at that point, right? You, you really define a program of what you want and then the model sort of executes steps that, that you um, define your algorithm, right? So, um, hmm. yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I think it's, it's probably not a time yet that this actually works or this is actually, um, something people do or build. I mean, in research for sure, but, but like not obviously not on the level of LLM um, and tooling. Um, but once this actually becomes possible, I think also lots of interesting new programming ideas will come up, no, new frameworks, new languages. And yeah, with, with the current LMQL, um, I think we would move a lot in, in, in the presence of such a, such a thing. Amazing. Luca, thank you so much. I think, you know, just, um, you know, firstly, understanding LMQL, when I first saw it, I think just like, you know, when I first saw the LMQL, my first impression personally was, it reminded me of VV8 Design, how we have kind of like a GraphQL API, as well as these client libraries, and you kind of can see the difference in, in my opinion, it's easier to design the GraphQL. And I, because I kind of feel like the syntax of LMQL looks like that compared to a lot of these frameworks, like, you know, I don't want to name them, but like <laughs> that, they require all this buy-in, you know, this is a little more open-ended than that. So I was always already super impressed with LMQL. The LMQL playground is a visual thing. I'd highly recommend people to see that because it's, it's brilliant, really. It, it, the way that it lets you visualize this complex prompt uh, execution is really super novel. And then those ideas around structured output parsing, that kind of like where clause in the LMQL syntax and how that restricts the thing all amazing stuff. And I, and then sorry to add one more thing, but how LMQL already integrates with Llama index lang chain and, you know, it's something you can kind of get running with. And then just kind of towards the end of our conversation, this discussion of, you know, the text bottleneck that just really opened my eyes into how the space could evolve. So, you know, Luca, thank you so much for the podcast. I think you're, you know, building a super incredible tool and you definitely have the visionary aspect of seeing where this technology is headed. Uh, before we wrap up, could you give listeners like your media, like how to follow along with you? Like, are you primary publishing papers? Are you on Twitter? Yeah, definitely. Um, you can, I mean, LMQL, you just find it at lmql.ai. Mm -hmm. It's easy as it's, it's that. We also have a Twitter account. Um, and I'm also on Twitter, um, Al Bureau Kellner. Maybe you can link it somewhere. <laughs> you can follow me there. Um, and yeah, also, please, if you want to try out LMQL, do so. We have a Discord. We always, most of the time, we're online and, and helping people out. Mm -hmm. so, so please feel free to reach out there as well and and happy to help and, and discuss also like more broadly LLM programming and where this can go. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. 
Yeah, well, quick, let me ask, for, uh, I'm curious about your perspectives on this Discord uh, community. How, how has your experience been building something like that for a new technology like this? Um, it's, it's um, I actually really like interacting with people, talk to them a lot. Um, it's a bit overwhelming, to be honest. It's my first open source project at this scale. Mm. It's a lot of support requests, and all of us in the team already have full-time jobs, so essentially it's another full-time job to do this. Um, but at the same time, the community feedback also has been uh, quite quite amazing, and, and people start to contribute. Um, and we are still like very much welcoming everyone who wants to, to hack on LMGL, um, brainstorm, and... And also, like, happy to help out beginners talk about their, their issues with LMQL. Maybe they, they want to get something running. We're totally um, happy to help with that. <laughs> yeah, I think it'll be it'll be a really cool demonstration of um, you know community feedback plus this science, this vision of it. And yeah, I'm super excited to follow along with it. Luca, thank you so much for joining the WeVA podcast. This is truly one of my favorites. I learned so much about the large language model space and how this can develop. Thanks so much for having me, Connor.